what, what was it about the collective suffering that brought people together? Because um, it, there's evidence that that's there, certainly. Um, but as you say, it's different from today. And I don't, we, we don't want to talk about today right now. We want to talk about that. What, what, what is it? Because as you say, the divisions were so stark at the time, ethnic, racial, et cetera. Well, I do think the depression um, was more um, egalitarian in who it affected. Uh, you know, today, one of the things, and you know, we have, we find to talk about today, I think, because in fact, for students, this is more meaningful sure. if they can make these connections. Um, you know, uh, today we're learning that there are, you know, some, look, I'm not suffering, I mean, I'm, I'm suffering, but not terribly. I still get a paycheck. I can work from home. Um, you know, the, the white blue collar divide is enormous. And as I was trying to suggest that even in the 1920s, um, you know, there were people, there were suffering and difficulties in a number of places. And that certainly was the case um, when uh, the, the, the Great Depression hit that, you know, it did, it, it did hit a lot of people. Um, you know, uh, over the years, I've had students do oral histories with their grandparents or, you know, who, I, relatives who might at least have heard about the Depression if they didn't live through it. And, you know, you get stories from lots of different parts of the country and different occupations about how people suffered. So I do think that the fact that it was widespread was significant. I do think that the, the point I ended on, that the, the, the New Dealers, you know, kind of went out of their way to try to build empathy um, and not to target one class or set one class against another. One of their objectives, of course, this was very, this was somewhat self-interested. They were looking to build a very deep, strong, wide base for the Democratic right. Party. Right. Right. So right. they were incentivized to, you know, bring people together, not to, you know, allow these divisions to come in. It, it is worth reminding, and, and and you know this as well as anyone. You know, there were dividers at that time too. Father Coughlin. And oh, others. yes. And uh, you know, th absolutely. I talk about that in the Atlantic piece. Um, and they, you know, but what Roosevelt, what I do also talk about in that piece is how what a shrewd politician uh, Roosevelt was. So when he was feeling sort of the pressure from Coughlin, he would sort of steer to the right. Uh, and when the pressure was coming from the left, he could go there too. So, you know, he was a master politician at um, you know, kind of undermining the, the critics. Um, so I think that, that that is an important point That's as great. well. Super helpful. Okay, uh, Christina Longofano uh, has the first question. She wants, she, she's asking if you could discuss the loyalties that were forged during the depression. She says, whenever my grandparents talk about politics, they always mention the Democratic Party, FDR and the New Deal and how they, they know, quote, who really has our best interests in mind. Oh, that's just, you know, it's so perfect. I mean, that's sort of fit. I feel like that's great, you know, a great quote from my, from my talk. Right. Um, and, you know, so there were real, this didn't just like happen naturally. One of the strategies that Roosevelt used were the fireside chats. Um, so that, you know, you, as I described, these are not people in general who think about Washington. You know, Washington's really far away. So he managed to come up with these radio talks where he would make a very personal connection to the American people. Um, they would be coming, you know, he would be coming into their living rooms on the radio. Um, and that mattered, mattered a lot. Um, and so that rather than seeing Washington and bureaucracy and government the way, you know, many people get turned off today, um, they saw FDR and Eleanor, let's not forget. And, and there, are, if you look at the, um, the papers in the National Archives, the Library of Congress, you see how many Americans wrote very personal letters to Eleanor and Franklin, telling them about their woes, asking them for help. They felt this personal connection. One of the photographs I have in Making a New Deal, for example, shows a, an Italian restaurant in Chicago where there's a big photograph of FDR over the bar. Um, you know, he's, lots of people had, you know, would tear out uh, portraits of Roosevelt and have it on the walls in their, in their homes. So, you know, they had a very, he, that was a very personal connection. Um, also, the, and this is something that runs contrary to, to some of the sort of literature on 
uh, how people felt about getting welfare benefits in the Great Depression. I think they were reading back from the post-war period often into the 1930s because I saw evidence where people felt, you know, I deserve to get a job in the WPA or to get some relief payments um, that are gonna come from the federal government to the state because they felt some of them had served in World War I, so they felt they'd earned it. They felt they voted and they deserved it. Um, so that I don't think there was this shame about it that you know later was very much um, you know encouraged by post-war leaders. So you know, in many ways, I think people felt this is this is my government, and um, you know they were told they had a right to this. Right, right. Uh, really important to this is the way FDR was able to convey empathy and the fireside yeah. chats, which you can play online now really convey that. I, I wrote a piece of, a couple of years ago in the Washington Post about this, which I just put the link up to. We will also oh, put good. up the link uh, to, to the Atlantic piece that, that Liz Oh, good. Read. Yeah, right, great. Um, okay, so next we have Daniel Simpson, um, who, who asks about religion and tent revivals during the, uh, during the Great Depression, as his great-grandparents uh, remember this, and he wants to know, you know, what are some sources on religion during this period? That's a good question and not one that I'm actually very well uh, prepared to answer because I've mostly looked at urban people. Uh, and my guess is that those religious revivals were more likely to happen uh, in rural areas, perhaps in the South, um, in the Southwest, um, even rural parts of the Midwest. So I, you know, I really can't, I'm trying to think about religion in the 30s. Um, well, certainly Father Coughlin, who was a Catholic priest, had an enormous listening audience in the millions, 20 million or something like that. I talk about it in the in the Atlantic piece. Um, you know, and now not all those people actually were, um, you know, were were Catholic. You know, it was it was a, just a kind of a he was a rabble rouser and a, of a sort of kind of a right wing sort, and he attracted many people. Uh, so I do think that, you know, but but probably a lot of Catholics. So there there certainly was that issue. Um, the I'm trying. I just really don't have a lot um, that I can think of offhand. Can you? Know, you? Darren Docek, I think, has written a bit about yeah. sort of the rise of the right and the role of religious activists during during this period, especially also around sort of the gospel of capitalism. Right, and mm -hmm. the sort of Kim, Kim Phillips fine. We can we can get a couple a bunch Zero, of. But I also would say that there was a very important religious left. Yes. Uh, you know, there were the worker priest. Um, you know, and and there was you know Dorothy a day, right. Catholic workers. Right. Um, so I I think that you know it's very likely there was a, the you know this right wing side, but there also the the you know the the the, the church and many churches were very important in. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, uh, encouraging, supporting unionization, um, and, you know, uh, being supportive of people in their struggles. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. A question from Crystal Garza. Uh, how do you recommend teaching uh, Mexican re repatriation during the Great, during the Depression? Yeah, that's good. I actually have a fair amount about Mexican Americans in Making a New Deal because they had been very present as workers at the low end of the, you know, the hierarchy in many of the Chicago factories and particularly in the steel mills. So uh, there was a large um, Mexican American population and it wasn't obviously just in Chicago, it was all over the Midwest and the West. Um, and many of them were when, you know, the depression hit, there was a lot of pressure to send them back home. Uh, you know, a, a familiar uh, chorus to today. Um, but it's also important to say that many remained. And uh, so that the Chicago Mexican American population actually, you know, really was present in, and many of them were involved in the unionization drives and only grew over time. So I think it's in, you know, one of the, the points you might wanna make is that the relationship of American employers and American uh, worker, you know, work 
environments to, to Mexican Americans has been one of constant expansion and contraction. Um, it was one of the attractions, obviously, uh, in that you know home is very close by, right. uh, and so you know the, the 1930s were no exception to that. Right, and I'll just mention my colleague, and I'll put his name in the chat. Emilio Samoro has written a lot about uh, Mexican Americans in the um, in the U.S. military during World War II, where they made during like World Japanese II. Americans a huge yeah. So, so they were still here, <laughs> right? And you know, it was often and still even more so in the post-war period a you know a a, a quicker route to citizenship too to serve in the military. So Anthony Gallos asks Liz, uh, how effective do you believe, this is a great question, revisionist history of the Great Depression, particularly uh, critiques of the New Deal, have been in encouraging deregulation. I think of Amity Schles and a number of other um, people who's, I don't know, I don't know if I'd call them historians, but those who have really sort of attacked the New Deal policies and said, no, these made the Depression worse. What, what's your reaction to those? Well, there's been many, um, you know, kind of it, many approaches to kind of demystify and kind of um, recognize the limitations of the of the New Deal. And they're come from many quarters. One of the most important ones, of course, is that many of the racial prejudices of, uh, you know, of American society were reproduced in New Deal programs. And I was assuming that Meg Jacobs will talk about that. But for example, the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, the um, much un unemployment, social security, uh, by negotiation with the Southern Democrats left out domestic and agricultural workers. And you know, I would say that what's very important there, and a lot of works, ink has been spilled over. It's not just unique with me. Is that this Democrat? This was a big tent Democratic Party, and the South was a very important part of it. And FDR knew that there were real limitations on what he could accomplish. Uh, but if you take something like anti-lynching legislation, which there was a, you know, a, a majority of Americans would have supported. Uh, of course, the South was not interested in supporting it. FDR didn't go there. Even though he did have a black cabinet, an informal cabinet of black leaders he consulted. So, you know, he too was sort of, he was aware of, of the limitations on how far he could go. The other critique of the New Deal that, you know, may be what you were referring to um, is often that, you know, basically the New Deal saved capitalism. And, you know, it didn't really make fundamental change uh, in American society. It may have, you know, kind of broadened the, 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 the possibilities for people, but in the end, uh, you know, not all that much was changed about who ended up, you know, kind of running the show. Um, so, you know, the, it, it's interesting though. I mean, that kind, these critiques, not so much the racial one, I'd say the racial critique has only grown, particularly right. with Black Lives Matter, recognizing that many of the problems we still live with have origins there. But the, the um, attack on the kind of um, limitations, political limitations of the New Deal was big with the new left history, history from the bottom up, you know, history in, written in the 70s and 80s. Today, after the kind of turn to the right and, uh, you know, in the 1980s and thereafter, I think there's, you know, a little more appreciation for the achievements of the New Deal, given what we're living with today, where it's been so difficult to get the federal government to step up and to take responsibility. And so many public responsibilities and functions have been turned over to the private sector. Right. So we have one final question. I'm going to sneak in here uh, in the last seconds. Uh, Daniel Simpson asks, uh, did the Great Depression lead to an influx of people to cities? Or did people migrate away from cities? And in any way, Liz, in which you can also connect that to the Dust Bowl, which, which didn't come Yeah, up. which we didn't really talk about. Didn't have time. I mean, I would say people were moving lots of directions. <laughs> um, you know, uh, there were people who left cities because they felt that, you know, if they went into the country where maybe their family, there was a family plot, they could grow their own food. Um, but when there were jobs, they were more often available in the cities as, as the decade went on. Um, many of the WPA jobs, for example, uh, were more readily available in more urban places. 
Uh, the CCC, of course, sent people out into the countryside. So, you know, people were moving all over. Um, and of course, the Okies, uh, I, I mentioned very briefly that there were these terrible droughts and they only got worse in the 1930s. And so there was this stream of people, not just from Oklahoma, that they were from many of the states in that same region, to California, um, where they worked in canneries and agriculture. And, you know, many of the uh, analyses of the post war California population growth trace it back to those people who who then often are are cited as keeping up these clubs from you know from different parts of the the old the Midwest where they came from um, so I would say that people were moving in lots of directions um, uh, in the 30s there was a lot of dislocation right um, and and that's important and then of course the war came and uh, again you know Things that things were more prosperous, and you will hear about the, how the economy ramps up first to supply our allies, and then, of course, we're in the war ourselves. Um, but that didn't solve a lot of the problems. It didn't solve the housing program problems. It didn't solve a lot of the other issues. And and I don't think people were moving around so much that some there was a lot of military um, activity on in the home front. Uh, camps, military camps in the U.S. People were moving around. My husband's um, father and mother moved four or five times because wow. he was in the Navy and kept being, you know, he kept going further and further west. Wow. So, Sam, I think it's our time to turn to 